This is Michael Rose. This is my adopted son for the Honkayapi, you know, the Lakota tradition. And blood cannot equivocally cannot celebrate that. Only those who we feel worthy of extending our own ethers back and forth to keep vigil on ourselves and our longevity and well-being. It's a thought, and we thought they were savages. Nay, nay. Oldest man in the room. Put your seatbelts on. All right. I thought I'd, uh, I had a friend of mine. I made two odd friends in my life. As a teacher, I oddly became friends with a 13-year-old you know, kid who just jived. And now he's 16 and we, we play some guitar together. My other odd friend uh, was, just passed away uh, last week. She was 85 years old. So two odd friends, I'm now 31. And uh, this is about uh, my friend, uh, one, uh, Janina, excuse me. So this is called a Happy Malady. Uh, it's inspired by her because when she talks, she was an art teacher in the city. And, uh, and when she speaks, it's rather poetic. She just naturally comes out with poetic phrases and things. So it's called a happy malady. Love, she tells me, sleeps in your mouth like a piece of fruit, warms and plays in us like a malady, a very happy flu. For pining is rooted in this, she says, and love rots with teeth like wild honey. Bees gather it and build their homes from it. But men and women pine for the taste, yes, long for the orange plush boards from which they might build their own homes. Sing songs for those blossoms, the nose just might swoon ones craving ears for. I have another poem about her dog, but I could not find it, so we cannot hear it. His name was Buddy O. His name was Buddy, and if you add, if you add an African uh, dash and an O to it, it's like a way of calling in one of the African dialects. And uh, Janina taught me that as well. So she called her dog. She said, Buddy O, Buddy O. We can't hear that poem though. Um, okay. I'll read one poem that is not a love poem, and the rest will all be. No title. The clock in this room ticks and talks and gawks at me. I gawk at it too. It is the loudest clock I have ever met. I suppose then that that makes it the rudest also. This poem, related to that poem, has a title. It's called The Clock in This Room. The Clock in This Room. The noise is a beautiful one. It connects me to all noises. It shares with me all beauty. It connects me to the universe second upon second. And if I had listened closely, I am connected to the universe beyond this one, the universe between seconds and far beyond my wonderful being here, right here, just here in time. Where is time when a clock ticks and talks, hoots and whispers, whispers and hoots? Tell me. I feel like, I feel time evades the clock and all those who are listeners to clocks. Me, myself, I am a timeless one here beside the beating watch, the thrumming keys in my infinite eyes. I sit in a blanket. It is green, white, blue, checkered, and patterned. I am a human being. I am a thinking midnight eye. My side has a pain in it. My head is achy and my pulse is heavy in my neck. That is all. My head aches like the Buddha's temples ached before enlightenment. I remember myself then. I perhaps should rather say, my eyes were still green like this blanket. My toes are cold now, but they were not then. One can only hope that if I rest my eyes quick, I will enter into the great stream of streaming and love and be nothing 
and want nothing and stroll with gods casually enlightening them on damp walks through the woods. Let me close my green blanket eyes and return to my source at last, at last. Let me hold this blanket like a grail and remediate the pains of my body that is perhaps not my own but Brahmin's in another form. Let me sleep, yes, and ask why can't I dream of the mist that floats above the pavements like an earthen spirit of the moon? The moon sheds light onto the window of my dreams. She harbors the deer who coyly dips their cool lips into the lake of the moon. And now the fish dream tonight. Perhaps they dream of me, or rather one can hope so. Truly, one imagines they dream of the mist that floats above the pavements and the spirit that breathes the mist in and out like an enormous fisherman of the world. I dream of the gutter and the creatures that sleep along her mental shores. Spiders and insects howl at the moon from the gutter and crickets sing songs to them from the grasses. Water drips. And between its drips, all of these things transpire. I dream, fish dream, pavements dream, lampposts dream, spiders dream, insects dream, water dreams, dripping dreams. And in this way, the world carries on beating as though on a pair of large drums which beat on their own selves and which listen out to their low music just beating, beating, beating like a gentle jostling of holy bones of sweet, deep lovers in the night. Uh, I'm going to read a few blood poems from the book uh, which I've written, The Rattles and Other Poems, entitled partly by my Uncle Peter. Thanks, Uncle Peter. All right. I lost my poem when this book closed, and that's all right. This is called Tribal Sounds. So these are all dedicated, 95% uh, dedicated to my wife, 5% dedicated to other people. <gasps> all right, Tribal Sounds. She wakes me in the morning, making goofy sounds like ancient cavemen. Yarbity, 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 she says and I fill a little more with every flightless chirp. Modern cave talk is the sweet talk of my soul. I smile, perhaps, more now than any other time of day, because her softness is more reliable than the induction that birds will always fly, and is as homey as a bird's nest. Sunlight cracks upon my face and warms the blankets. I feel like an egg waking on a frying pan or a stove clock waking on an outlet. I am awake, that is all I'm saying. And waking in these myriad ways beside her distant curls and with the sun and with the world more broadly is a good way to go on day in, day out, rising from the cold, cold dead. This poem is called Hands. Lean your head on me again, your orange pulp hands gently laid on my lap, your body slinking in and out. You give a nestle like the sound of Buddhist chants. Your om needs the space like a giant pair of hands, sifting through strings of gravitational calling. Giant curled fingers sail on placid lakes where lotus flowers sit budding atop the surface. Blue goddess palms cupped like Christian hands reaching out for alms. Deep red cardamom scented wrists rise north on the bow like a delicate mass. It's called Beneath the Shadow of the Moon at Six. Sort of a breakup poem and then eventually a reuniting poem, <laughs> Beneath the Shadow of the Moon at Six. I saw you tonight beneath the shadow of the moon at six. Yes, it is still winter in New York. 
I watched your lips and the inflections of your voice while you spoke, saw beauty in your lips and all the rivers and braids of your hair, love in the cores of your eyes. I hated my lack of control then. It showed me how far I have wandered from the heart of this most important truth. I love you. That is all. A leaf. I have felt you so long ago now. I have flitted to the cold earth and felt its stuffy moisture and knelt against its concrete altar. I am sad here though, alone. My limbs heavy, my heart big, my body lone and still. I miss the honey of hard roots and the sweet nectar of a hand, a nestle, a kiss. Tell me, where do I go at fall when the, sun's le when the sun leaves? And with it, her eyes and the quiet echo of her breath beneath my breath, beneath my breath, beneath my breath. The hum of a beautiful moment. The hum of a dryer, a refrigerator, faucet, pipes, pots cooking, and a woman whom I love gently cleaning the coffee mug. Indeed, what a beautiful moment keeping the music of time like an escapement sailing above the moon on a torbillion raft. This is called Beauty Has No Eyes. I love the sound of your voice. It sounds like a baby whale cooing into ocean currents for its mother. Your voice is soft like that. Your laugh is abrupt. It hears itself and always hides in the shadows behind the moon. It always bears your thoughts sunk in sweet yellow currents, soft and delicate, but heard. I hear what you cannot, your heart beating two by two, your breath on my hair beneath my scalp, your hands like porcelain glass, sides of the curves of blue earth back like honey. I hear the parts of you with my hands too, for beauty, it is said, has no eyes. This is called this is called, I have nothing to write. I have nothing to write, so I will let you pull from in me, like a string of my nerves were tensely gripped by your fists, beautiful fists, hard fists that I love. As you grip them, I will feel a sense of the beautiful. You, Paul, and I spasm upon the ripples in the skin of my ribs. You grip and I shriek a noise, my lips quiver. My hands tremolo in a note of music that was never before shed to human ears or betrothed to human flesh. My heart is in a non-corporeal place. I close my eyes here and we are reminded both of what our love is without the shackles of breakups or of eternity. Yet we are reminded also of red-hot tears, the colors of August heat, and hard, crumbling buildings in a ghetto painted by God, blue like the river Bengal, gray like clouds of smoke, red and green as though we're all the sole earthen child of the aurora borealis. Isn't this crumbling city the insides of us all? O oh, you, my love, the color of Embellia. You grip them, these hard ancient strings, and I whisper inaudibly that I love you. I tell you aloud, take all of me, please drown me in this river between us. I will in turn drink this river sticks, and I may find you on the other side, my love, where eternity is no more than yesterday. This is called a far off place. You guys are getting the love poem uh, reading.
<laughs> a far off place. Your hands have a freckle on them. Actually, there's a funny story to this. I'm not too funny, but I was uh, like 20 years old, and my so my wife and I we uh, we've been together since I was basically I was was I 17, 15, since 18. I was 18, and it's now 31. And so we so we separated though for a few months, like six months, and. Uh, some my friend of mine came to my workplace and she comes up behind me and maybe she's flirting with me, but I'm not sure. But she kind of, I think she's just we we're friends and she comes behind me and she kind of like mirrors my feet. And I, I immediately thought my my you know my wife my my wife has come and, to my workplace and anyways and this is what came of it. So it was it was never her in the poem. So this action takes place in the poem, but it was never my wife. So I never told my friend this either. A far off place. Your hands have a freckle on them, or perhaps I'm imagining that. At any rate, in the way that I am remembering them, they are beautiful. Your palms are soft like the insides of an orange. Your wrists exude citrus notes that twist me inside like a swirling rind. I miss your hands. Today you covered my eyes with them. And I returned home and dwelled inside the marrowness of your bones. Again, again, again I overflow. I am he who overflows. I felt your breasts against my back. The material of your clothes, your cardigan drapes grazed my elbows. I felt that you were smiling. Your smile was contained in your body meeting my body. And in your hands, and in your clothes, this is how you smile. You forced my feet into semicircles, slight wormholes in the earth in which I attempted to find you. Like a kid, you mirrored the movements of my feet and torso. Oh, your maniacal methods. They stall my eyes in the capture of your soul. Yes, I wish to capture you, love. To capture you, love and store you in the cupboards of my dreams. And so I stop and miss you there, within the tapestries of dreams. For I am not there. I am here, where I am alone and like a hound dog. Um, okay, that's enough of little things, I suppose. This is a poem about eating a sandwich. And it's, uh, I took it, I took the title somewhat from a, uh, no, entirely, but edited from a line from Ezra Pound. The title is, An Ant is a Centaur in His Sandwich World. And at the moment I'm forgetting the line from Ezra Pound, but that's all right. The ant is a centaur in his sandwich world. Beehive earth littered with moles. Elfin forest that is sturdy like a board. Rain-covered swamp filled with raw straw, sweet crayfish. White cranes stand like crooked pieces in the still water. Quietly, a crocodile waits in the waters to collapse his jaws onto living earth with 10,000 loathsome teeth. I am the crocodile. Lunch is good. <laughs> Um, I'll read a poem, let's see. I want to read, ah, this is a poem. <laughs> I'll just read a couple more and I'll let set us all free. I never read this poem, but I will today. I don't know why. Here we go. This is called, <laughs> I Say I'd Like to Sing. Just kind of a fun poem. I don't like this style, this way the words combine, for it seems to write itself today. But no, I am apart, I say. Dear me, I'd like to sing. But this choir is a lone man, a strider in the steely deep. I flash a wily smile. This smile, it is not me. This is most certainly one another. I, I know my feel, barefoot in the rain, quickly in the ocean, settled in the soul. 
My frills are not so fragile. My words do not crumble through teeth or drip from lips like pipeless sinks. Instead, yes, I steep them in my soul, I think. I spill them from the drum. I batter with loose feet. I drink them from the sun. I breathe ripe like a summer's airy breeze. Or so I so believed that I once grew gardens by my pen. Today I steal away, I know, for I am not sure of he who holds or lends. All right. Let's see. All right, well, I'll read one last poem. This is called My Eternal Ears. Hmm? My Eternal Ears. I have placed the labors of my soul into this poetry. Indeed, I have invested in it in the heat of many moments when obligations in the world have called my name. Ask that I come down from the hilltop to place my fingertips into the dirt. Upon nights when sleep begged to be had, but I was in love and would not. Nights when the contours of a woman's body rolled over in my mind like a giant sleeping Venus to turn my chest, hair, and shirt inside out and wanting more. And there was myself then, memorizing the bones of her skin, the geometries of shape, shapes, which protruded beautifully and pale from her gold cheeks, memorizing the words within her moist purple plum world and the vanilla scent of her sweetened hair, spoutless, countless moments in which I was finally able to bend reluctant branches of eternal ears to the lost graves of charry caves that lent crutches to the limping, hollow, broken-heartedness there inside of the world of me, low stooping like a forest ground of blunted stumps. It is in the moments of such magnetism that I have always believed love was enough for poetry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Wonderful young man, very gifted. And Bill Seaton, the youngest man in the room, another very gifted soul. And um, tonight was a magic night. And you see our joy in sharing and all are welcome. The power of the word is the most precious thing we have to freely express the true meaning of life. It softens all the hard edges. And um, it's most important that we reassert the whole formation of literacy with a willing investigation of classical education, the Greek and the Latin and languages that we get into cursive skills to develop left hemispheric tactile ability. And to really develop a passion for solutions. It's very easy to bitch and moan. There's not any time for that anymore. There's only time for solutions. So make sure you are one, and we grow in that synergy. Peace. See you next month. And thanks to the powers to be of the Howland, General Howland, who gave this to promote well-being in the community, the Florence Northcutt, through her selflessness to make a 501c out of this, to perpetuate this as a cultural center to Craig Wolf and Tom Devier and Anda Lieberman, and I bid you adieu.